to do with heaven or hell? I, I think it's a really good question. And it's really interesting because we're going to actually talk about money today. <laughs> what? Why, why would I do that? We're, we're, this is the wrap of the series on heaven and hell. So the first two weeks we saw about the descriptions of hell and what hell was described as th- through the Bible. Then we saw who was going to be in hell. Then we talked about the descriptions of heaven as the Bible describes it. And then we talked about who's going to be in heaven. Why would I all of a sudden jump to this? <laughs> no. Because if you actually unpack Jesus, when he's teaching about heaven and probably the most exhaustive part where he's teaching about heaven is found in the book of Matthew in chapter 25 a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about evil and wicked we looked at Matthew chapter 25 and we looked at the parable of the sheep and goats which is one of the big teachings about heaven and judgment that Jesus teaches on one of the other big teachings uh, is in this chapter as well too is about the uh, 10 virgins that are waiting for the return of Jesus Christ and so that's another big chunk of Jesus talking about the future. And we picked up some of those themes throughout our series as well too. But sandwiched in the middle of this, in the middle of these 10 virgins that are waiting for the return of Jesus Christ and the sheep and the goats and judgments is this parable called the parable of the talents. Now, if you've been around for a while, you know this, this, this parable. Um, we teach on it quite often. Usually what happens with the parables is we teach it uh, the parable of the talents as we teach it as that the talent is your gifts and what God has given you and your resources and your time and I do think that is part of it because in order to make money in life you need to invest your time your talents and your abilities that God has given you but the definition and when Jesus teaches this and the audience that hears this when they hear the word talent they hear the word lots of money so scholars have argued about, well, what, what is a talent? Like, how much money is it? And, and it's kind of all over the spectrum. Most commentators believe that it's a big amount of money. Some commentators say that a talent is like 20 years of salary. So this isn't just a little bit of money. This talent, when, when God gives in this parable these talents to these individuals, he's giving them a huge amount of money. And God's people, the the Jews that Jesus was teaching, and and everybody that was listening to this, that's what they would have been thinking. They would have been thinking, okay, Jesus is talking about money, talents here. After he's just talked about the the, the ten virgins, five that were ready and five that weren't ready, and those that weren't ready uh, are cast into hell, and the others that were ready, uh, they get to go to the great banquet just after this, Jesus is going to teach on the sheep and the goats, and the, the sheep are the ones that hear God's voice throughout their life, and they're the ones that heed the social justice issue and feed people and go to prison and pray for people and live out their faith. A lot of times, they don't even know it, versus the goats that are the ones that, that don't do anything. They just kind of hoard their time and their money, and they leave life to themselves, and they don't ever serve Jesus, or they don't serve God. And then Jesus is here talking about this money. So if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read from verses 14 and following. And we're, if you'd like to join me, you can. I'm reading from the NIV. It'd be on the screen as well too. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Doesn't that kind of stink? Like that kind of goes against the grain of our culture, doesn't it? We live in a culture where everything's supposed to be fair. This is what socialism is all about. Take from the rich, give to the poor. And there's elements of of that in our faith in terms of how when we are given um, gifts and resources and we're supposed to look after the orphans and the poor. This is the hands and feet of Jesus. This is the parable of the sheep and goats in the following chapter. But this kind of, I don't know about you, but it bugs me. Because why do some people get five? Why do some people get three? And why do some people get one? Particularly if you're the person who only gets one. Yeah, according to your abilities. But it, that's just like, come on, God, really? God knows everything. And we need to remember our place sometimes with what God has given us. Because it's interesting, I think one of the reasons why Jesus teaches on this, and maybe this is one of the reasons why I wrestle this, is because there's another scripture in the Bible that says what? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. 
And so I think the reason why Jesus throws this in here when he's talking about heaven and hell is because this is so important. Because where your treasure is, so will your heart be. And so if you're amassing wealth up on this planet and this earth for yourself, well, chances are you're going to be consumed by yourself. But if you're amassing wealth and prosperity and trying to use the gifts that God has given you, the money and the resources that God has given you to bless other people and to be faithful to God and to listen to his voice and ask him what to do with it and how to use it for his kingdom, then you're going to see great things happen. It's interesting in this series, The Chosen, that uh, my wife and I are watching. We actually went and saw the theaters this week just to support it. But part of the, of the, of the, the group of disciples that we often miss that they bring to light is that a couple of the ladies and a couple of the disciples and one of the fathers, they're actually taking the resources that they're getting and they're investing and they're trying to build something at the same time as Jesus doing all this ministry to support the ministry. So they bought an olive grove and they're trying to make the olive grove produce good olives because it really did produce good olives because it was just a cheap piece of property with cheap plant. So they're learning and they're buying sulfur and, the, and it, it's not all the details in the scripture, but it's an interesting point of view, and the scripture does teach about this, that Jesus, some of his disciples, they were working to make money to fund the ministry. You'll see later on in ministry that there are certain women and elders and people in the church that are working to fund Paul's ministry and Peter's ministry. So God gives each one of us one, two, or is it three, or five. I'm going to continue on. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the bags of gold, when at once had put his, sorry, his five bags of gold, when at once had put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a ho hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Notice that the guy with the five bags and the guy with the two bags got the same reward, the same compliment, the same affirmation. Even though they had different levels and there's a significant different level of finances going on here, they both got the same praise from the Father. However, then the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. It's kind of insulting. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See here what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever, who will, for whoever has will be given more and they will be have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. And throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know about you, but that is harsh. Like in my world, little brain. Like, really? He didn't lose the money, did he? And yet because of what he did, nothing, He's judged very harshly. And so this should get our brains thinking and whirling. <laughs> because when we're talking about heaven and hell, what? Really? Like, what I do with my money matters on an eternal perspective? Like, I'm sure you've probably heard this. If you give to God, he's going to bless you. 
If you, if, if you give money and, and you give to the church, then God will bless you and you'll, he, you can't outgive God. And, some of those, and those are true. I'm not, I'm not going to debate that. There, there are parts of Scripture that teach that. And there's, there's different levels of Christianity that kind of take it and run with it. It's called the prosperity gospel. I spent two hours talking to somebody about two weeks ago, and um, he unfortunately was at the butt end of this where a church had basically drained him of all his money, and he was a little too trusting and gave away way too much. Um, and, and the idea was the church taught him that if you just keep giving and you give more and more, the more that you give, the more God's going to bless you. And sometimes that's true. A lot of times it's not, but it's not proper teaching. And here you have this crazy parable in the middle of nowhere that talks about money in the context of heaven and hell. And so what do you do with this? Because I think a lot of times you might hear that extreme, you know, God, you know, give to God and he'll give back to you. And, look, and, and again, that's part of what God does teach. If we do give back to God and we give what's his, and, you know, I, I do believe that God will bless us and he will look after us. But we don't really preach on this too much. Usually this message is taught talents. What's God giving you with your talents? You've got to be faithful with the, not, not the, the money part, I mean, that's part of it, but the gifts that, you've give, that God's given you. And, and sometimes it's usually preached in a church so that we can get volunteers, <laughs> right? We need kids in the kids' ministry. Uh, we need leaders in the, in the kids' ministry. So let's do the, the, the parable of the talents, and you can use your talents to serve God, and someday when you get before heaven, you'll be rewarded for taking your time and taking the talents of your love for kids and, and using them in ministry. And you know what? I actually believe, and I think the Bible teaches, that's part of our faith as well, too. The talents, the time that God has given you, yes, we're to use them. We've taught about this in the last couple of weeks to point others to Jesus Christ, to serve those that need help, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in orphans and widows and the poor and the impoverished. Yeah, well, all of that is true. But what about this crazy idea about the money that God's given you? You're going to be held accountable for it someday. I don't know. So here's some thoughts and some observations about this passage for you to think about today. First of all, everyone has been given something. You remember that Jesus is standing in Jerusalem, and the disciples are with him, and there's people going to the temple, and the temple had a big box, a treasury, and you were to give your money in this treasury, and that's how you supported the temple. Kind of like the box at the church, at the end of the church. And so the idea for a lot of these Pharisees was to walk by this box and they had these big purses of coins and they would throw them in the box. Look at me. And so Jesus and disciples are standing there they're watching all this go on and then a lady comes up with one coin and she kind of sneaks it in the box because she's embarrassed. And what does Jesus say? She has given more than any of the others. So it doesn't matter whether you have one coin or billions. God has given every single one of us something. One, three, or five talents are what is represented in this parable here, but God has given each and every single one of us something. The Salvation Army received some pretty strange items uh, in their Christmas kettles that they do at Christmas. And I read this article once. Lieutenant Michael Harper, the commander of the Cambridge Salvation Army in Boston, said, in addition to money, he's seen watch batteries, paper clips, safety pins, and all kinds of strange things. But one thing takes the cake. There was a gift of a diamond engagement ring one day that was dropped off in the, one of those little globes, valued at $1,850. And her wedding band in one of the kettles placed outside Boston's North Station. The rings were donated along with a note honoring the benefactor's late husband. I've dropped my wedding wing, ugh, say that fast. I've dropped my wedding ring in your red kettle knowing that the money from its sale will buy toys for needy children, the woman wrote. In all seasons, my husband was a giver. I especially remember his joy in giving at Christmas time, especially to those in need. To honor his memory, I donate this ring. This ring sold a few days later, even though it was only valued at $1,800 for $21,000, 11 times its appraised value. 
The anonymous donor did give some clue as to part of her motivation, writing a short proverb at the bottom of her note, to find out what a man is worth, take away his money and his possessions. Everyone has been given something. And sometimes that's hard to remember because maybe we're drowning in debt. Maybe because we look at our bank account and it shows negative or it shows $10 or $20 and we would like it to be that much bigger. But everybody has been given something. And that's a good reminder for us as we think about our eternal and where Jesus is going to take us and welcome us and what we're going to do with what God has given us. What have you been given? The second observation of this parable is that the faithful servants know their prophet. They know it. They don't come back and go, uh, let me just kind of figure this out and <laughs> pull some stuff over here and pull some stuff over here. And I got They were good stewards. It didn't say that they were warned. It didn't say that they knew when the, the, the master was coming back. He shows up, and they've got everything lined up. They know where everything is. They have everything organized. They say, oh, I've gained you five more. I've gained you three. Here it is. It, it's all here. I did something with what you gave me. They knew their profit. They had taken evaluation of their lives. They had taken evaluation that someday the master was going to return. They had probably set some goals and some targets. They had taken the resources, the money that God had given them, and they would started investing, and they don't tell us what but they did something with it to make more money? It's interesting that, and I'm not sure if this is the same statistic for Canada, but more than half Americans have no financial plan in their life. Half. That's in, in the United States. And I, I suspect that it's probably way worse in Canada. Northwest Mutual sponsors an annual study exploring the state of planning in America today. Uh, that provides unique insights into people's current attitudes and behaviors towards money, goal setting, and priorities. The study surveyed more than 1,500 Americans aged 25 and older. Here were some of their results. More than 6 in 10, 63% of Americans say their financial planning needs improvement and that they ha their, their number one obstacle to their planning is time. Nearly 7 out of 10, 70% of the pace say that the pace of life makes it harder for them to stick with long-term goals. More than one in four, 26% people say they either often or always feel too busy to think about long-term goals. The study showed that half of all Americans have no financial plan in place and that only 60% are highly disciplined and actually have a cohesive plan. 16%. That's not even two out of 10 people. And that's in the United States. Now, why do I read that? If God has given every single one of us something and the faithful servants knew what their money was doing, then we should as well too. Now that's challenging because we are busy. We are consumed. There is so much temptation in our society to spend in all kinds of different directions on so many things and so many pleasures and leisures and things that we like and that we enjoy. And I am not here to tell you what that balance is or what you to spend your money on or what you're not to spend your money on. All I'm trying to do is raise what's going on here in, when Jesus is talking about eternity and talking about heaven and hell and going, hey, everyone's been given something. Every servant's supposed to know what they're doing with their money. Every servant needs to take time and think about this and value this. The third observation here is that faithfulness will be rewarded. Even the five, even the three. Whatever they did, it doesn't specify what they did. But whatever they did, they did it and they made more. And because of that, God was pleased and they were rewarded. They were rewarded. Thinking about the future. Again, what heaven and hell and the concept as we've seen over the last couple of weeks is what we think about eternity dictates how we're going to live today. If we realize that somehow God is going to hold us accountable for the money that he has given us someday, then that's going to change how we live today and what we do with it, won't it? There are a handful of hinge moments in world history. On June 6th, 1944, many of you might recognize the date, is D-Day, one of those moments 
in our history. On that day hung the balance of power in World War II and the fate of the war and the world. One of the most unknown heroes of the D-Day, though, was, listen to this, was a man who never set foot on Normandy Beach, never commanded a single troop, and never wore a uniform. His name was Andrew Jackson Higgins. Higgins was the man responsible for designing and building the LCVP. I don't know if you've ever seen the movies, but this is a small landing boat that would line up, come up in the ocean, and then the, the hatch would line, fall down, and all the soldiers would go rushing out. He was the one that designed that. But it's interesting that at the time, the Navy was not interested in the design at all, and they were more interested in larger vessels like destroyers and battleships. They had no interest in these LCVPs. So Higgins, on his own, with his own money, not only designed it, but started building them. And they're known as the Higgins Boats. But Higgins saw what the Navy couldn't see, that after the crossing of the channel, the large ships would not be able to get the troops close enough to the shore. The assault on the beaches of Normandy involved dozens of battleships, scores of destroyers, and thousands and thousands of Higgins boats. The larger vessels transported personal equipment across the English Channel under the cover of darkness. Then as tens of thousands of troops boarded thousands of Higgins boats, the destroyers and battleships barraged the coastline from a distance to prepare it for the landing troops. All because one man saw the future and the future need for these boats to be used because if it had been left up to the Navy, they would have just chucked them off to the side. When it comes to our resources, the money that God has given us, as we think about the future, as we think about what God wants from us and calling us to do and to live, it's important to remember that faithfulness will be rewarded. The other negative observation about this parable, negative in the sense of what it does to the last person, is about fear. It's interesting that after this man insults, and that's literally what he does. I know that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Scattered seed. I was afraid. Fre fear distorts and cripples people. You know, one of the great things about the money that God has given you is that it's not your money. And so, at some level, we are called to think and process and think about what we're supposed to do, to pray, God, what do you want me to do with this that you've given me? How am I supposed to use it for your kingdom? How am I supposed to keep my treasure in heaven and not here? And maybe it is keeping piles of money in the bank because God's got a certain plan for it at some point. Maybe it's a drain. To, I don't know what it is. But here's what it means. It means that we need to not be afraid and build a relationship with Jesus so close that when he taps us on the shoulder and says, hey, I need to do something over here. I need you to support this ministry. I need you to give over here. I need you to bless that person. I need you to invest this. I need you to put this in the bank. I don't know what it is. I'm not a financial planner. But whatever it is, don't let fear cripple what God has given you and to hide it or to bury it or to be afraid that someday God's going to come back this horrible, hard, obnoxious God that's going to just like judge me for what I haven't done or have done with your money and here's your money back, God. I just, I didn't know what to do with it so I put it in the ground and here. I didn't lose it so that should be good enough. I wish part of the parable was about a guy that lost the talent because that would have been really interesting, right? So, God, I took this great risk because I really thought that you were calling me, and it failed miserably. Because some of the wealthiest people in the world, and you hear the testimony, they don't, they don't, they've got some pretty big failures where they sometimes lose everything, go bankrupt, and then they build it all back up again. The good news is that God knows your life and your lifespan and everything that's going on in you. And God has entrusted you with what you can do, with what he's given you. He knows you. But he wants a relationship with you so close that you know what to do 
with the money that he's given you? How to invest it? What to do with it? For his kingdom. But don't let fear distort or cripple you or cripple your relationship with God. Timothy tells us that the root, that money is the root of evil. And so there's a duality in our lives where when we hold money freely and ask God, what do you want me to do with it? And are working on that relationship and spending time thinking and praying about, God, what am I supposed to do? That God can take what he's given you to do incredible things, small or great. The opposite is also true that money can be something that can bind us up and could actually separate us from God. We just hold on to it so tight because we're so afraid. Because I might not have enough. Or I might not be able to do this. Or I might not be able to buy that. And so we hold it so close that it actually hinders or breaks our relationship with God. And I think this is the reason why Jesus put this here. Was to help us think that someday... We're going to stand before God. That someday we will be judged as we talked about a couple weeks ago about what we did and didn't do. Did we feed those? Did we visit those in prison? Did we take the time and what God has given us to serve him, to be his hands and feet? And then what did we do with the resources, the talents, the money that he gave us? Did we grow it? So what do you do with this information? Well, there's some really difficult questions we need to ask ourselves, and I'll tell you, they are difficult. At least I think so. But what are you doing with the money that God has given you? Is it growing? Now, I think one of the difficult parts of this question is this is not always measurable. So in this parable, it's really neat because it's kind of easy, right? I had five talents, I got five more, I have a total of ten. That's easy. And that's part of what God's looking for. But I think a lot of what God's looking for too is I had five talents and I gave one talent to this and I did this talent with that and I invested in God's kingdom and I've grown your kingdom, God. Because I was listening to your voice and and I really think that you asked me to do this or give to that person or support this or whatever it was or give to the church. There's that element as well, too. The attitude and the heart that connects us with God. And so sometimes this is a very difficult question because sometimes it is in that monetary gain and other times it's just in the spiritual gain and influence that we don't see. God does and he knows. But at the bottom of that question is are you growing God's money? Is Are you actually thinking about it? And are you doing something with the money that God has given you? So we ask ourselves that question. Am I being responsible? Am I being a good steward of the money that God has given me? Because apparently to Jesus, it matters. Are you being faithful? Does fear cripple this conversation? A lot of times we don't want to talk about this in the church other than just the fluffy stuff. Because maybe we haven't been good stewards. There's a lot of people, for whatever reason, need help with this. And if you do, find a good Christian financial planner and somebody that can help you and say, okay, you know, I had $8,000 that came in last month and $9,000 went out. You got a problem. The problem is not that you're $1,000 in the hole each month. The problem is is that someday you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, how'd you grow my money? And you're going to, well, it actually went the other way. And it wasn't because I was spending it on ministry and doing things you asked me or called me to do. It was just because I was spending it on myself. And this is difficult because our society is expensive. But don't let what the world tells us and the world pushes and the fear, oh, you need to have a million and a half dollars in order to retire because if you don't, you can just go, maybe you do. I don't know. I never will. (laughs) But what's God asking 
I'm calling you to do with what little or large he's given you. The amazing thing about Jesus is as difficult as a conversation this can be, as difficult as it to ask these questions sometimes, is that you don't have to do it on your own. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, in the book of Acts, after Jesus left, his disciples are all gathered, and they're, uh, they're all freaked out. They're like, like, what happened? He was here. He died. He was back again, and now he's left again. Like, wh- why? Like, come on. And Jesus had told them to stay in Jerusalem. They're all staying in Jerusalem, and they're just like, now what? And then all of a sudden, they are what? They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit does some crazy stuff. <laughs> Peter gets up, he starts preaching in languages he's never even spoken. People think he's drunk and he's out of his mind. Why? Because he's speaking in tongues and he's, because he's filled with God's spirit and all kinds of other people from all over the world are hearing Peter preach and they're like, we know what he's saying. And the religious leaders are like, ah, they're just drunk. You can't be just drunk. They were filled with God's Holy Spirit. And here's the awesome thing about being a Christian is that when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, you're filled with his Holy Spirit. And the cool thing is that you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to think about your money alone. You can literally sit, spend time with God, spend time with the Holy Spirit, say, what do, you, what do you need me to do? What do I need to do with what you have given me? Guide me, help me, bring the right people in my life to help me if I don't know what to do. Bring the right ministries into my life if you want me to give or to donate or to help support them. God, Holy Spirit, just help me do this well. Help me be the planner and the person that you need to be to prepare my heart and to prepare what you've given me for the day where I stand before you. And the good news is, is that he will be there with you every step of the way. That's the incredible thing. A couple caveats or a couple of exceptions or even <laughs> exasperate this problem even more, is if you are married to somebody who's not a Christian, this is even more complicated. And so depending on where you're at, depending on your relationship with your spouse, depending on male or female, and a whole bunch of different dynamics, reach out and have some conversations with people that are, know you well, know your family, know your heart, pray even more, because that's even more of a difficult conversation because now you have somebody in your life and you're, usually your resources are pooled together. And so, you know, what do I give impacts your other spouse and your other partner? And so there needs to be some really tough conversations sometimes. And maybe you might have to back off and just wait. And that's difficult. But again, you don't have to do it alone. You've got the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of you. So you keep praying on behalf of your spouse and praying, God, just help me. Help me lead by example. Help me to be the person that you want me to be. Help us, give us opportunities. Maybe passions that this other individual that I love so much that I'm married to, maybe something that they can get excited about so they can support that. There's different things that you can do. Get together with another person, take them out of coffee and brainstorm. Like, you know, I don't know. There's different things you can do, but it's, it's even more complicated. But at the end of the day, the question that we need to be asking ourselves from this parable, from Jesus' teaching is, what am I doing with God, with with what God has given me? And to keep our hearts and our attitudes pointed towards him and our prayer life and our intimacy with him so close that we know we're not doing this alone. And that when we seize the moments and we see the opportunities that we're actually growing what God has given us for his kingdom, Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, your will be done, not mine. Your kingdom come. I like building my own kingdom. It just comes naturally. But your kingdom come. And that's what I'll be judged for when I stand before Jesus, is how did I contribute to his kingdom? How did the money that he gave me contribute and grow for his kingdom? for his will and not mine. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this incredible series that we've had. We have seen the depravity of hell and how you've rescued and saved us from that and and how that has just given us such a passion to worship you 
and to love you so much more because of what you have done for us by rescuing us. <laughs> but you didn't just rescue and save us. We then have seen how you've created this amazing paradise with creatures and angelic beings and heavenly hosts where we get to share an eternity with you and joy and peace and no more pain and no more suffering. Oh, Jesus, we look forward to that day. But you've also given us this time in history, each one of us. And you've given each one of us in this room and listening this morning online, you've given us something. You've given us a certain amount of money. And although it's a difficult conversation, Jesus, we want to contribute to your kingdom. We want to be found as faithful servants. I want to be found as a faithful servant. That someday when I stand before you, you will say, well done. Wherever you are this morning, online or here this morning, whatever your financial situation is, great, small, struggling, prosperous, do some business with Jesus this morning. Ask him to guide. Give up your right to control our finances to him. Let us be, Jesus, a generous people, a kingdom-building people, of your kingdom, ever thinking of the day when someday we stand before you so that changes the way that we live today and impacts every area of our life, including our pocketbooks. For this we pray in your most holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen.